They're the people we hope never to need. But when an emergency occurs, they're all we depend on. Um, it's an emergency. Tell me exactly what's happened. I'm going to tell you how to stop the bleeding, OK? Filming with 999 call takers, emergency paramedics and their patients. This is the continuing story of the men and women of the HSE National Ambulance Service. That's the bits of this job I love. Great fun. Hey, 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 hey. It's OK. It's OK. This time, what happens when a holidaymaker's adventure takes a step too far? Any time you get a call to Blarney in the middle of the summer in Cork, it's for a tourist. It's a bit of drama on a Monday. <laughs> How ambulance crews face inaccessible locations in a life-threatening emergency. Where is, where is he? The only way to get into the patient was to climb over a very broken wall. Five Lima 2-2, ring the guard. And how every detail matters in a panicked call for help. Even the most basic question of, are they breathing? All we can do is hear. We can't see anything. I want you to turn her, turn her on her left side. Previously on Paramedics. Seems like only yesterday we were here already. Everything's been grand, yeah. Getting used to the stardom. You've been recognised now places, you know, you'd be going along the street and you'd be getting, oh, that's the guy from the telly. So, yeah, it's a bit unusual in that sense. Even on some of the calls, you'd arrive in some of the calls and you'd get, it's, it's the chap from the telly. And you're going like, no, no, we're the chaps from the ambulance. You know, we, we just happen to be on the telly. Yeah, Peter and myself, big divorce um, October last year. Myself and Imelda, we worked together for a good few years. So um, Imelda moved up to a supervisor rank. So um, because she moved to a supervisor rank, um, the two of us had to kind of separate. He left me for another man. And that's all we're saying about it. Unfortunately, we had to split up. But I got a new partner. I suppose I, I can see why they stay together for a long time. Um, they just bunks off each other. And I might just, I have very big shoes to fill. Um, trying to, uh, I suppose, match his, his humour. Fierce nice fella, I have to say that now, because, you know, I'll be working with him for a few years. His, uh, his ability to do the job is just second to none. Um, I'm learning loads from him as well, and I hope that, you know, I'll be kind of the new Imelda for years to come. We get on really well, like we pull on each other's strengths uh, and things, and, and, and we do the best we can for the patients, which is what it's all about. 999 mode activated. Things can change in an instant in this job. You don't know, you know, where you're going to end up. We've ended up in the middle of weddings. We've ended up in christenings. We've ended up anywhere you can think of. We've been nightclubs. You know, when I was younger, I used to go to nightclubs. Anytime I'm in a nightclub, no, it's because I'm on a call. We got a call to Blarney, um, a lady on top of the castle after collapsing. So, top of Blarney Castle, an elderly woman, short of breath, and disease. We do get a lot of calls to Blarney Castle. It's never too taxing. You get there and they're waiting in the cafe or something like that. So on this occasion, the call came in for a lady collapsed on the top of Blarney Castle. It's never going to be in the castle when it's raining. It's always going to be on top of the castle, and it was on top of the castle, so we just knew we were going to get soaking. Hello. Please help. And you see that? Oh, right, by the after, but just go to the castle. I'm going to the castle. Thank you. We have 
rain jackets and rain leggings and all you know wellies and all these things that we can put on but it's just too warm in the middle of the summer to put on all your rain gear and things because you just you just pass out because uh, you've t-shirt on shirt on your normal pants all this other kit over it you, you, you just literally be well I'd be worn out anyway by the time I'd get to the top of the castle oh there's a boat in today isn't there a cruise liner in from the states today any time you get a call to Blarney in the middle of the summer in Cork, it's for a tourist. So you always have to bring a certain amount of equipment on every call. But if 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 you're going to be far away from the ambulance, and especially if it's going to be kind of a, a trek to get to where you're going, you have to decide what kind of equipment do I need. Yeah, I'll keep going, but they'll see us with the high wheels. Super. Thank you. Blarney Castle is quite narrow on the staircases, and they're like a spiral staircases. So one part of the step is wide, but the inside part of the step isn't even two inches wide. So it creates huge issues trying to get somebody out of the castle. Bit of competition between myself and Joro D anytime there's a stairs, especially with the marathon training and things going on. So it's always like who, who's going to get up there first and who's going to make the other guy sweat. So of course I got up to the top of the castle first. After climbing 137 concrete steps of a spiral stairway, we found this lady lying on her back. She's lying kind of safe enough but uh, right at the edge of the yeah, well, yeah the castle on the very very top of it very very pleasant fully alert lady who had come in on a cruise ship as many of them do come into cove during the summer period how do you feel now at the moment um scared okay there's no need to be scared you're quite safe for us okay She's had an episode of collapse she's been unconscious for a period of time and um, any time we went to set her up, her blood pressure and heart rate dropped and she went unconscious again. So obviously we were assuming straight away a you know, possible uh, blood pressure problem. Yeah, so her blood pressure is down a little bit. OK, so that's probably what's causing the dizziness and things, OK? So it's nothing too worrying, OK, but it's just only a small bit, OK? The weather was quite bad and she was actually out on a parapet. So the rain was coming down top for her. Now, there were a number of people holding umbrellas. Yeah. But as you can imagine, it's an old medieval castle, so the room was tight and, you know, it was it made it quite awkward. OK, we'll keep you covered here for a minute and keep you nice and as warm as we can for a minute. OK. So we, we have to make a decision on a call. Is it really important that we get this person to hospital quickly? Or, is, or do we have time and can we manage what's going on and do things a bit slower? So with that lady, it was okay. We were able to manage whatever was going to happen with her. So I'm just going to put a few sticky dots on your arms and legs there and just take a, a look at your heart and things. How do you feel at the moment? Okay. If anything changes, you, will you tell me? She was very calm. She was very receptive to anything we said to her. She understood everything that was going on, you know, and she was quite willing to kind of leave us do what we needed to get her job done to, for, so that we do the best care for her. We did all our checks and everything else. And then the next question is, how are we going to get the lady off of where we are safely? We're actually going to get a helicopter to take us off the roof. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. So, it just, uh, have you the roof clear, lads? Because we'll have to have everyone gone from the roof. Yeah, we'll have to have everyone gone from the roof is the only thing just to be safe. So we actually considered requesting the um, search and rescue helicopter, the Sikorsky from Shannon or Waterford. Our thoughts were to take her the extra few feet to the very top of the castle and have her airlifted. Now, we weren't looking to have her airlifted to the hospital or anything, but maybe just to pick her up bring her over and drop her down to the ambulance. I'll just pop this off a second. Hey, there's still update there from Ambulance Control. It's uh, the TSP and Mountain Rescue that are coming to work on the Waterford the Beach there because the dome draft in the hilly uh, may be too much there for the lift over. Roger, whatever they feel is best. The 
Coast Guard people came back and they said, you know, just with the fact that the castle was kind of a bit old and things like that, and there, there might be issues, they just thought it wasn't suitable at the time. So we lose, we'll see when the rescue people come here what they feel is the best way to take you out. As with all calls, you have to involve as many services as is necessary and explore all options to do what's the safest for the patient. And that's always our, our focus, what's going to be the best for the patient and what's going to be the safest for the patient. So the next port of call was the fire service. And we said, that's their, that's their business, you know, they're the, they're the rescue experts. So once they arrived, we had a bit of a meeting with them and discussed the options. So the goal is, if we can, to keep her flat, whatever way we can get her done. If not, if we need to sit her, whatever we have to, but whatever way you feel is the best way of getting her out here. Their platform that they would normally extend up to take people off is actually a little bit short for the top of Blarney Castle, so we explored all the options and the only option left to us was actually um, wrap this lady in the special mattress that we had and um, physically lift her down that spiral staircase. It's a bit of drama on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> what we did was we put her in a vacuum mattress, so this mattress is like a, a big bean bag. You suck all the air out of it, it goes fairly rigid and it kept her nice and cocooned and nice and safe so that if we just, you know, if we brushed against one of the walls, she wouldn't wouldn't get a, an old scrape off of the wall or anything. So we'll do everything nice and slowly, Gail, okay? And any time you want to stop, you tell us and we'll stop for you. Okay. All right? And it has good carrying handles, so we were able to carry her down the stairs. One, two, three. No, you're quite safe, Gail, okay? Bit of an unusual sensation and things while we're moving you. Is that all right? We normally huff and puff about, you know, houses from 1920 with their narrow staircases and rickety old steps. But we always manage to get people out. But we're talking about a medieval castle. <gasps> OK. Yeah, perfect. To be fair to the fire lads, they, they're always the first to jump in if there's lifting and things like that with us. Right. OK, Gil, you're quite safe, all right? Yeah. All right. I suppose it was a very, very awkward um, extrication of anybody we've ever taken out of any building. Come on, do you want me? Yeah, you're done. Come on, I have it here. I'll have it here. I'll stay this side if you can stay that side and we'll kind of stagger ourselves. Big team of firefighters, great effort between themselves and ourselves, and to be fair, the staff of Blarney Castle, they, they did everything they could to uh, facilitate getting the lady out. Yeah, we got the lady down, took a bit of sweat and a bit of effort into the ambulance, and that's the thing, that's, that's, the, that's the next step done. But the second the lady's done, back into medic mode again. No pain anywhere or anything? No. Good. Probably the talk of the crews, I'd say, and probably the talk to the grandkids for a few years about how they went to Ireland. And uh, the man with the funny accent came up to the top of the castle and, and, and um, Granny had a bit of an episode. So how long in total is the cruise? Uh, the 15th was the last day. Is it? Yeah. 15 day cruise. We end up in Denmark. Pretty good. Excellent. The main thing is the lady was kind of okay afterwards. She got into hospital and got the care she needed. We learned later that she made a full recovery and thankfully made it onto her boat just in time to uh, carry on her cruise. Since our last filming, uh, things have changed a lot around here, uh, and some of the things that have changed is uh, the faces that you would have seen last time have uh, progressed and gone a little bit further with their training. Uh, Laura, who I would have been with a lot in the last series, is now an advanced paramedic as well. I've been a paramedic for nine years. I went back to college in UCD to upskill to be an advanced paramedic and achieve my graduate diploma in emergency medical technology. Um, that basically gives me uh, a higher clinical grade and a better scope of practice um, to, to treat patients on the road. Laura's gone off and abandoned me and uh, taken up uh, stock with uh, Katrina. So I've lost Katrina as well. Advanced paramedics and paramedics are always trying to crew up together. So um, I get to work with Laura a lot more, which is great. Because we get on so well together. Honey, we 
find love right where we are. I love working with Katrina. Um, she's great fun all together, and you always know in the morning when she's in because you can hear her laughing nearly straight away, um, which is a great way to start the day. Um, and we usually have a good few laughs during the day as well, um, which is very important in this job just to, you know, keep the morale up and, and keep the humour going because you know some days are better than others. Needless to say. Yeah, but yeah, it's good to mix around. It's still Miss Lorda. With the likes of Andy, we'd usually only um, work together on calls where we're both called to the same call um, on higher priority calls, for example. My limit to two, query will have a heroin overdose, 40 year old male, unconscious, 23 Delta 01 India. So we got a call for a suspected um, heroin overdose. It's still a, a scourge, it's still a, a major issue we have in Ireland. And um, since sort of the late 70s, early 80s, heroin has really been a, a big problem uh, in Ireland, uh, in both rural and suburban areas. It's not always like in a house or, or somewhere safe. Sometimes um, they're, they're in an outdoor location, um, sometimes they're they're on the street and sometimes just in very awkward positions altogether that they obviously didn't think about prior to uh, they were just looking for somewhere quiet to obviously um, you know use the heroin um, and, and forgetting obviously about the the side effects and access for the likes of ourselves that need to get to them. I'm putting this on so somebody might hear us. Yeah. When we arrived to the general location of where the scene was, um, we were have, having difficulty finding it. Um, we had just kind of a, a loose general area as to where where it was. We are obviously hoping for someone to try and flag us down or, or try and tell us where to go. We have no contact here. There's nobody out around Tesco's. We got to this road and they told us on the, on the radio that um, somebody would meet us on this road and bring us to the patient. So we drove up and down the road, I think twice, and there was nobody to bring us to the patient. There's nobody waiting. There, look, there, oh. straight ahead. Eventually we did come across a gentleman who was uh, a bit panicked looking and um, tried to flag us down. Where is he? Up here, where? where? Whereabouts? Where that green car is? Right, just go, go, go on, go on, go on, go on, go, go. We still weren't in the right location and we had to try and get him to guide us into where we were supposed to be going, which was um, further up the street again towards um, a derelict um, building. Where is he? The only way to get into the patient was to climb over a very broken wall. It was not a stable wall, it was very unstable. Here, I'll... is that wall okay for you? No. So yeah, not the best environment to start off the call. Five Lima 2-2, two, two. ring the guards and the fire brigade for this address, please. We got another crew then came and backed us up. On arrival, I could understand why the, the backup call was uh, put in, because when we got there, we discovered that the patient was below sort of yeah. ground level in a sort of what looked like a bunker or a coal shed at the rear of a building, yeah. uh, a derelict building. Okay. Andy Sharp. Sharp, yeah. Before I could even look at the patient, I was looking out to see, one, was there anybody else there? Because it was pure dark. And there was lots of tin paints and stuff. And then I thought, OK, is there any rats in here or mice or anything? Or what else is in here along with me and this patient? I don't know what the story is, but like his legs are under him, like. Just fell backwards. Possibly just fell backwards. Yeah. Because of the position that he was lying in, we weren't sure whether he'd actually um, fallen from the height and this is where he landed, or whether he had actually gone into the coal bunker himself of his own accord and this is where he'd actually just taken the heroin. So obviously we had to try and basically treat what we found and assess the, the gentleman as we went along. That's the really wash your hands. Yeah. I know we all know. There was um, used needles all over the place, all over the ground. So we had to be really, really careful where we were stepping, first of all. And when we were going to put our hands down to town towards the patient, which was lying on the ground, we had to be really careful where we were placing our hands. It made it extremely unsafe for us to operate. 
However, uh, Katrina and Lauren had assessed the patient and, and figured that he wasn't breathing properly for himself and required uh, intervention immediately. The first thing we did was in certain airway uh, because to help him help him breathe, basically. Um, and then we gave him naloxone, which is a drug to reverse the effects of the heroin. You're gonna check down. I'll get another uh, naloxone ready, just in case. But unfortunately, on this occasion, that, like that first dose of naloxone um, did nothing at all for him. So we had to um, kind of keep administering more doses of naloxone until such time that we got an effect. One minute at a time. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. You're right again. One, two, three. Okay, here we go. Once we got him out, he started to come around then. Okay, so BP good, uh, BM good, respirate is good. Was six, it's now 14. The local fire service yeah. finally came and cut the chain off the gate, which is the only reason we could get the stretcher in to beside nearer the patient. But obviously he still had to be carried up all the steps. My name is Katrina, I just want you to relax, Thanks, okay? Sir. Just relax for me, Pep. Anything that needed to be done could be done for that patient because we had so many people on scene. Definitely in a situation like that, um, we needed a lot more help than, than just the two of us at the time. With the manpower that was there, we managed to carry the patient up the flight of stairs, which again uh, was quite precarious and qu quite unsafe. But this patient was what we would call time critical. He wasn't breathing enough for himself, even after a number of doses of uh, reversal agent and having given him oxygen for a, a period of time. So by the time we got him into the um, ambulance, the naloxone had um, taken effect and the gentleman was able to converse with us and was able to tell us what had happened. You're not on any medications for anything? Are you on methadone? Yeah, and you're taking heroin as well? No. So what did you take today? You took heroin today? Yeah? How much did you take? Huh? A lot. If we had have taken any longer to get there, or if help was never called, that man would most definitely be dead now. You can't survive on not breathing yourself or very, very little breathing. Um, you won't survive for very long. So you're grand now, there's nothing going on. Blood pressure is grand, heart rate is grand. You're breathing for yourself, 100% oxygen, OK? Because you had so much heroin. The fellow that was with you said that you had a lot. He said you had a half a bag of heroin, OK? So you're going to the hospital because in case it starts to kick in again. To go within the space of that happening to you nearly almost dying, Within, yes, 20 minutes probably, sitting in an ambulance talking to me, telling me where you're from, telling me your name, telling me about your family, and then for you to be in a hospital and within two hours have gone home, gone, left the hospital and fine. It's extraordinary. Have you kids? No. Have you a girlfriend or a wife or anything at home? No. Mom and dad, sisters and brothers. Yeah? Yeah, they'll be glad to see you tonight, won't they? The use of heroin in uh, our community, it hasn't gone away. Uh, it's still there. The public generally don't know about it because, like the scenarios we've dealt with with the patients been hidden away from public eye. We go, we treat them, we extract them. The public don't know what that was for. As far as they're concerned, it was just somebody who wasn't well, has collapsed. We don't announce to the public that that patient was a heroin user or was a heroin overdose. So the general public aren't fully aware of it, but the emergency services were well aware of the fact that the problem hasn't gone away and there's still multiple users of heroin and heroin abusers uh, around. Nationally, the ambulance service responds to over 820 calls for help each day. 999 Emergency and Patient Transfer Services are received and dispatched from the National Emergency Operations Centre in Donegal and the newly opened Rivers Building in South Dublin. The Old Control Centre, which is where I started in, smaller area to work in, but we covered less of the country. So um, about a year and a half ago then we migrated across to, to here. It's a fantastic 
facility, totally different from the last uh, facility we worked in. State-of-the-art building with windows. We can look out at the mountains and the sun and the sky and everything, which we never got the opportunity. The best we got were walls out the window. The room obviously being a much larger room than it was in Townsend Street and dealing with much larger areas, um, it's split into a number of different sections. Uh, so you have uh, a call taking section, which is self-contained just for the call takers. Uh, you then have the dispatching section. You have aeromedical then run in the room as well. Uh, you also then have the ICS, which is for the ICVs, and ICS call takers as well. Bally Shannon control the west and the northwest. So the, the dispatchers for the northwest and the west are in Bally Shannon. There is a number of call takers then up there as well. But we all answer for the whole country. So when the call comes in, it rings here and in Bally Shannon. Some people might refer to it as our standby control room, but it's actually active in the same way we're active, um, operational 24-7. Collectively, we're all doing the same job. It's just one, we're doing from two different centres. A good few people now that in the first series would have been call taking are now across dispatching um, and doing a good job of it as well. There has been an awful lot of staff changes. Um, I think it's the nature of the kind of work that we do. Um, some people are lifers, some people um, discover when they get here the job's probably not really for them. and they move on, but as I say, that's the nature of the, of the job we do. I'm still here. I did a stint over dispatching as well, uh, but have since gone back to call taking now. And that's really the only kind of changes. It's it's kind of the same, well, not the, it wouldn't say the same old, same old, but it's um, still the same job. She's crying in the background, is she? OK, it's a good sign, OK. So I joined in August 2015, so I'm just here over a year. So I'm still classed as a newbie at the moment, but we're getting there. Realised I wanted to be in the emergency services probably about five years ago. So since then I've been doing bits and pieces to try and focus on uh, getting into the emergency services. So here I am. Two years, two months, a lot of calls. A lot of shifts, so yeah. It's considered reasonably a long time in this game, from a call taker's point of view, anyway. So I've been in the job now a year. I feel um, I feel I've enough experience. You never stop learning. There's there's not a day where something strange doesn't come in. As an emergency call taker, we answer um, 999 calls from the public. So if someone has an emergency, they'll ring through and get someone like myself or my colleagues and uh, we'll answer the call. Ambulance emergency. We find out exactly what's wrong and we'll talk them through um, what we can do to help, like deliver a baby or if we have to deliver CPR over the phone until the ambulance crews arrive. Now tell me exactly what happened. You could be dealing with absolutely anything. When you push the button, you don't know what you're going to get. She's going into a fit, is she? OK. Never the same day. So you come in on one shift and you could have nice, handy, tipping away, nothing too hectic going on, but a lot still emergency calls coming in non-stop. And then another day it could just be everything up in the air. You could have a major emergency going on in Shannon Airport where an aircraft is coming in and they're landing heavy with a lot of fuel on board. And you could have an incident on board where you have somebody sick that needs to get to the hospital fairly rapidly. What did you take? OK, I'm organising help for you now. Stay on the line, I'll tell you exactly what to do next, OK? A lot of the time, it's usually not too bad. It's something you can just deal with and it's fine, but sometimes you're dealing with some of the most horrific circumstances anyone's ever encountered. Is he bleeding or vomiting blood? I know there's some people who take their job home with them. I'm not really one of them. I try and keep everything that works so when I leave work, put the head, head set back in the locker, um, go home, stick on the, the, the radio in the car, try and leave the Jabba um, behind me. Yeah, yeah, look after yourself, bye-bye. If you're taking the job home with you, you're going to lead a more stressful life, and it's, it's uh, you know, that's, that's the advice that people gave to me coming into the job. How did you fall? You've done damage, OK, are you still on the ground? 
Okay. For us as a call taker, we're sitting in a control room where we have a headset on us. All we can do is hear. We can't see anything. We don't know what's going on on scene. Tell me exactly what's happened. Has he had more than one fit in a row? You're relying on descriptions to you. So that description of the situation or the scene in front of them is then building your mental picture of what's going on. When she stops fitting, you need to lay her down and make sure she is breathing. I want you to turn her, turn her on her left side, on her left side. We need them to tell us exactly what's going on. So if we ask someone even the most basic question of, are they breathing? And they say to us, well, I don't know. You're our eyes. We need you to look at the patient. We need you to see, is their chest rising and falling? OK, just tell me exactly what's happened there. I get a lot of calls that people would be unconscious and they're unconscious due to drugs or due to alcohol um, or they could be unconscious due to an assault. So it's very, very important that we try to figure out the information. She has a knife, OK, I need you to get away from her, OK? So put yourself out of harm's way, all right? It's important that we don't send a lone responder or a response car in on their own if it's a drug-related incident or if it's an assault where the attacker could be still nearby. So it's very, very important that we try to interpret the person as best we can. And it's really, really important in this job to listen and um, to background noise to people in the background um, and try to figure out what actually happened. You're trying to be like a detective. OK, just let him rest there in the most comfortable position and wait for help to arrive. I'm going to stay on the line with you here as long as I can. So just watch that man very closely and look for any changes. If he becomes less awake, if he starts getting worse, I want you to tell me immediately, OK? And we can only help them based on the information they give us. Um, there have been occasions when the crew will get on scene and say, well, we'll re respond to a particular code. But when they got there, the chief complaint was totally different. But that happens. We can only enter details as the caller gives them. But for the most part, they're 98% correct. That's all right. You just take some nice, slow, deep breaths, OK? You try and get your breathing back to normal for you, OK? I know you're sore, but I'm going to stay with you until the, the crew arrive, all right? So we need the caller to be our eyes. We'll be the ears, we need them to be the eyes, and we need them to t give us every bit of detail that they can possibly give us so we get the best information over to our crew for when they arrive. Night shift. Interesting is the only word I can put on it. Night shifts and day shifts. Yeah, they're, they're, they are different. They're as different as night and day. The control room on a day shift, on a 7 a.m. to 1900 shift, it's very busy. OK, stay right with her. Make sure her head is carefully tilted back and check breathing often. OK, if she vomits, turn her on her side and clean out her mouth and nose. Days, there's a lot more going on. Um, you'll be a lot busier. Because everybody's up and about. Um, the whole nation's up and about getting into all sorts of bother and mischief. <laughs> so there's a lot of calls. Sometimes the phone actually won't stop. Is the person who hit him with a hammer still there? No. Where's he gone? Evening shifts. Till about 2 o'clock in the morning, can be extremely busy. And then the call's coming back off, and there's a much more relaxed feeling in the control room. Now, how, how much bleach did she take, do you know? Was this accidental or intentional? It tends to be at night, you'll get your car crashes, your drunken fights, um, drunk people not knowing where they are, uh, suicide attempts. So th for me anyway, I, I feel it's a little more complicated at night, but once it kind of hits three or four o'clock, um, things will ease off. But especially on Friday, Saturday nights, you're manic. OK, I know you probably got a shock, did you? Yeah, it's OK. Midweek, when the students are finished, you don't have the 2 a.m. phone calls from the nightclubs. It's nice. It's I won't say easy going, you still have your emergency calls that you're going to get coming in, but you don't have as many difficult calls as how I describe it. I know you're in a lot of pain. Did you hit your head when you fell? Just your back. What did you hit your back off? I think I prefer the day shifts. Um, because you're still getting home on the same day. I'm always a day person. I ne I'd never worked nights before. Um, 
So I done my first night shift and I have to say I fell in love with nights. During the days when you're off, it's great. You can have a couple of days off together and you can do things like doctor appointments and get the car fixed midweek. Is he conscious now, is he? OK, so if you can get that towel, put it firmly on the wound and don't lift it up to look, OK? I'm a night owl, so I like night shifts. Uh, I, you know, on a day shift, I'm up early and it, it doesn't doesn't appeal to me. I prefer the days. Uh, they're just easier. It's more natural to the body to wake up early as opposed to waking up at 5 o'clock in the evening and going into work till 7 the next morning. I prefer night shifts. Night shifts personally are my preference to day shifts, but day shifts are good because I don't feel quite so much like a vampire when I come in on a day shift. The person on the other end of the phone as far as they are aware or are thinking, the only person helping them here now is this guy I'm talking on the other end of the phone. But there's the guy sitting beside me, there's the dispatch, there's the ambulance crews, there could be the knack desk if a helicopter is needed. There could be 10 people involved in just that one call. And their only aim and concern is, is to get help to the person they're, they're looking for help for. You're doing great, OK? Just keep a close eye on her there for me. What is the best part of the job for me? The people. Genuinely the people. I... I love working with the people in this place. Don't you look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> They're a good group, though, you know? Um, you're never on shift, and you look around and go, oh, God, help me. They're, everybody looks after each other. It, it makes what can be a difficult job not be a difficult job. It's the people I work with, um, the fun you have with them, and it's the people you help. Probably dealing with the callers. Easily the best part of the job for me is helping people. You're helping strangers who need you, um, who need help. Uh, it's kind of, kind of it's rewarding, especially you know if you've got a panicked mum whose kid is unwell and you calm her down and the crew arrived there in a, in a good time. It feels good, you know. You're helping them out and you don't ask for anything for it. It's just your job, you just do it. Why I do the job and the best part of the job is it could be my family member that's picking up the phone to ring 999 or 112 to get help. Um, it could be someone that I know, someone that I love ringing for help, ringing for an ambulance. And it has happened where my family had to ring an ambulance and I have worked here and I knew they were getting the best care provided. The absolute pleasure I get out of helping people is, is, is brilliant. That's, that's the best part about the job is I love it. And I tell all my friends, and I say it out there all the time, I love the job. If you can give people information on CPR, um, give people information on how to stop a bleed or how to assist with birth, they're, they're the best ones, without a doubt. Um, that's, what, that's what puts a big smile on your face. I love being able to say at the end of the day that I work in a really worthwhile and helpful job. And going home exhausted and tired after 12 hours shift and sitting on the couch and having a cup of tea and saying, that's my day done, bring on tomorrow. I'm ready for my next shift. OK, thank you. Bye now. Bye. We've also lost Scotty from the base here, but not as a not as a colleague. He's just gone to the motorbike unit. Yeah, it's a huge change. I have to say, it has, it's a huge change coming from the ambulance and doing the solo responder. Yeah, no, I never sat on the bike uh, before. I was in the service. I met the lads in the bike and motorcycle unit. It seemed like a nice bunch of lads. I liked the look of the bikes. I liked the. I thought it was a unique part of the service, I thought it was very specialised. I went, that, that's really nice, I'd like to give that a try one day. So I got the licence and then the advertising, I went for it, and I managed to get a place. So uh, a lot of people don't believe me when I say I never sat in a motorbike until I started this job. It's, uh, I don't know if that stands to you or it doesn't stand to you, but it's, it's, a it's a great job to be doing. I have to say it really is a good job to be doing. Not a bad old man on the bike at all now. As I say, on the ambulance, you, you have a partner. And the day goes quicker, because you have somebody to have a bit of banter with, 
uh, we have interaction at A&E departments and uh, different hospitals that we call to uh, as a solo responder. We don't go to A&E de &E departments, we just deal with the patient, and then we do a handover with the crew, and then they're gone, the patient's gone to hospital, we're clear and available, and then we go off and we do another call. We don't have a designated area that we're, we're attached to in Dublin region. We have a base, but we're, we're not, you're not in the base. So once you're on the bike, you're out on the road, uh, you're, you're tagged to anywhere. We got sent a call to um, Sally Nogan. It was a, a cyclist had been knocked down arrived on scene just as one of my ambulance colleagues was coming up behind me. Hi, gang, what happened? Oh, she tell yourself, she just came off the bike. Apparently there was a lady on a bike and she had one of these bucket things that goes on the front of the bike, the kids are sitting. Apparently she was going along and just clipped the pavement and the thing overturned. Are you coming to the back of the ambulance and have a look? <laughs> We're going to bring you into the back of the ambulance with your mammy, it's okay? Yeah, we bring them on out. Oh, Bit of a turmoil as well. The kids were all crying, they were all hugging their mum. We tried to assess some of the kids, but they didn't want to know, they just wanted to be with their mother. Totally understandable. Uh, it was very frightening for them and the mother as well, because she didn't know what, what had happened. And, uh, it just cause it just happened out of the blue. Hey! Hey! <laughs> you alright? Have you been to Amos before? No! Most of the kids just had little scratches, cuts, bruises. Very upset. Very uh, just want to be with their mum. So we kind of just we had uh, a few more resources arrived then because uh, we told control there was three kids involved and an adult. So they sent us a few more resources. Is the helmets all there? Yeah. I just want to have a look in the mat. Just the helmets. Just want to see the marks on them. That's all. Yeah, yeah. The, the two year the. Yeah. No, that's just a. The, yeah, a little scuff, that's grand. No, it's just, it's just, it's just it for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, there's, no there's no big No, that's yeah. grand. We can see physically they had scratches, a few cuts. Uh, there was some damage to their helmets, so we knew they, they came over and they landed on our heads. Okay, that's probably all good. Stephen is my name. Okay. That's Scotty there, you mean? Hi, how are you? Hello, guys. Hey, gang, how's it going? Hey. We have a couple of techniques that we use uh, when it comes to kids, just get them to laugh and uh, giggle and stuff like that and it just they're, 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 sometimes they're able to tell you the level of pain but if they don't want to tell you anything they just won't tell you a thing they'll just wrap themselves around the mother and that'll be it you, you can do really nothing they won't really, they won't let you take their temperature they won't let you take take a pulse they won't let you take a blood pressure it's just it's um one of the more more difficult sides of of um the job is actually the working with the kids yeah. now can i straighten this leg <gasps> Is that sore? Is that one sore? Is it? And is this one sore? We try and keep kids and mother together if we can in a situation like that, because it's more relaxed and the kids feel more at ease. Uh, and then a couple of my colleagues and myself, we started assessing each, uh, a kid individually while well, the mother was being assessed so they could see what was going on. Can I ask you to just look at the seat oh, in there? Is that great. causing any discomfort in your you neck to, at all? You have to look at your neck. Any pain there? No. And if you look all the way over here? No? Yeah, it's a bit sore. A bit sore. Yeah. Is it sore in the middle here or is it to the side? Side. To the side, OK. It turned out the kids were all OK, apart from scratches and bruises. Mum was a wee bit of shock. I think they agreed to go to the hospital just for a checkup, just to get checked because of the mechanism of injury. We. We'd be more worried about the mechanism of injury than anything else because the, the, uh, the cart went over the top of them and landed on the top of them. That's not too bad, actually. It could have been tremendously worse for the kids, uh, but everybody was fine, mother was fine, so she was happy that it was a good, good outcome. Uh, was happy enough that they went and got checked. and. Uh, is, and to be checked, just to be checked on the safe side, you know. Something that we can't see, like it won't show up on, on our tests. Yeah, it just gives them that wide berth to go home safely, you know. So it was a good outcome for us. <laughs>